afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's uh, conversation with a coach. Today, we're joined by River Hawks women's basketball head coach Tom Garrick. I'll turn it over to Robert Ellis, the voice of the River Hawks, uh, to take us through today's conversation as we get going. We do wish for this to be as uh, interactive as possible, so if you have questions, feel free to submit those to the Zoom group chat, and uh, we'll direct those to coach as they come through. Um, and we are recording, so if you do have to leave early or if you you don't get to get your question in, we will be able to resend the recording to everybody so you get the chance to, to catch up. Without, with that said, Bob, I'll turn it over to you to take it away from here. Thank you very much, John. I will say good afternoon and welcome. This is the fifth in a series of what we call Conversations with the Coach. Today, the focus is women's basketball. We're honored to have UMass Lowell women's basketball head coach Tom Garrick with us. This is an effort during what I guess we can describe as kind of extraordinary times to keep in touch with our fans and supporters. It's an effort uh, to keep the channels of communications open. It is an effort as well to have a little bit of fun. I think we can probably all use a little bit of fun. I hope that this high tech gathering finds you safe, healthy, and in good spirits. As I like to say, we're all in this together, maybe a little bit stir crazy, but we will all get through this together. Now, as to our guest, Tom Garrick, he is in his second season as the head coach of the UMass Lowell women's basketball program. He's previously coached in various roles at Boston College, at Rhode Island, at Virginia, and at Vanderbilt. He played his college ball at Rhode Island, uh, helped lead the team to the NCAA tournament. He played in the NBA with the LA Clippers, um, three seasons there also, had made stops with San Antonio, uh, Minnesota, and with Dallas. As far as this past season goes, uh, for women's basketball, 2019-2020 was probably unlike any year that we have experienced. Uh, the team finished 16 and 15, their first over 500 season as a Division I program. They were 11 and 5 in America East play. It was an interesting year, probably the definition of growth during the season. Uh, lost their first seven games. At one point, they were 3 and 9. Then they went on an eight-game winning streak, which found them... 7-0 in conference play at that point. Uh, the season had, for me, and I'll admit my role uh, in connection with basketball is usually as a photographer, and sometimes games look different when you're looking through a camera. But days that stand out in my mind was a victory against Albany. Uh, the team had a good lead early, fell behind, showed its poise, showed its maturity, and showed its confidence, I thought, in then coming from behind and defeating Albany at the Songus Center, there was also the memorable game on field trip day against the University of Maine, which may be one of the finest performances and one of the best atmospheres that we can remember at a college basketball game in Lowell. The team earned home court for the America East playoffs for the first time, beat UMBC in front of the home crowd. I think it was six, I wrote it down here, I'm looking over, 66-58 in the tournament opener. The season would end a little bit later in the playoffs up at the University of Maine. That's kind of my thumbnail overview of things. I uh, thank you for your patience in letting me go through it, but I want to turn it over here to head coach Tom Garrick and, and kind of get his overview on this season gone by. Tom? Uh, first of all, let me say hi, Bob, and thank you for hosting me on this chat. Um, I wish all the viewers right now um, uh, good health, safety, and, and continued resolve throughout this pandemic. I know that we'll get through this uh, better on the other end than we are right now. We just have to stay, um, uh, stay consistent with our, our, our daily routines and follow the structure put forth by the government for us. So um, I wish everybody uh, a, a safe travels throughout this pandemic. Um, really happy to be here today. Uh, I think that this is such a good forum to connect with uh, the, the fans of the program, boosters, uh, donors, the community basket, uh, basketball community at large. I think what we have to sell at uh, UMass Lowell needs to be needs to be heard and needs to be seen. And I'm really proud of it. Our, our administration, our athletic department administration, um, starting with Peter Casey is, is just phenomenal. And they're the reason why we're able to do what we do. And I think they have a, a big role in how our basketball team, our women's basketball team has, has changed their fortunes uh, in such a short time. And I look for that growth to be continual. I don't think it's a one hit wonder type of a year. I'm really proud of the year that we put forth uh, with our young people. This past year being my second year taking over the program, 
Uh, the first year was a little bit of a rocky road in that my expectations were higher than I thought that um, our team was ready to achieve. So I had to tamper those expectations, coach the team that was in front of us, um, and give them our all and, 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 and usher them into a new millennial, I guess. Um, whenever you take over a team that has fallen on hard times, the culture is the biggest part of what needs to change. Uh, the atmosphere and the belief and the way the team sees themselves uh, is what needs to change the most. And that takes, I can't say what, I was going to say it takes more in the year, but it's an ongoing process. It's an every year thing because you have new people coming in as freshmen adding to the pot of the upperclassmen and the returners. And it's up to those returners to get the new people on board just as quickly as we can. So it's a yearly thing uh, as far as culture and chemistry changing. But I think that's the biggest part of why we had our turnaround this year is because the people who were here from the first year were able to get the new people on board and the new kids coming in came with a little bit more, uh, I, I guess a little bit higher skill level and they bought into what the older kids uh, leadership was. And then it becomes an easy thing. Kids who wanna be coachable and kids who wanna work hard, uh, they can reach their level of potential a lot quicker and that's what happened for us this year. Although it started out pretty rocky with an 0-7 start, I, I think our kids' resolve and their belief in themselves is commendable because anytime you start off that poorly, um, the, the, the season can go downhill pretty quickly. But it didn't for us because our kids believed and they were just as upset um, with themselves at the 0-7 start as, as anything else. So that's why the turnaround was imminent and we could see it coming because we're, we're with our team every day and they never wavered. Even at 0-7, there was never a woe is me type of feel to our team. The hunger that they came into with to practice with on a daily basis, it was unbelievable. Uh, I, I wish that, you know, and I, I was talking to Bob earlier before um, the chat actually started. I would love to do these chats between myself and my assistant coaches. I would love to do these chats once we get back on our feet and things start to go back to normal on a weekly basis, a monthly basis or whatever, because I think people need to see the inside of the program and how it works. I wish people could come to our practices because you would see the resolve that these young women had this year. And um, that's why the, the turnaround wasn't a surprise to me. The 11 and five was great. Uh, I think we were a couple of games away from being in second place. I think Stony Brook was a, a little bit of a reach for us this year because they had maturity and physicality over us. But I think everybody else in our league was attainable. Um, and it wasn't a surprise to us that we were beating people this year. You talk about the culture and one of those in the audience writes and asks, uh, I guess, for more details about how one changes the culture, saying, Coach, what are the key ingredients to building a strong team culture? And at what point this season did you feel as though things started to come together for the team? I would add to that, does a change in culture come from the players or from the coach? Good, good question. Uh, I think it's both. I say, so how you change a culture? You, you change it by example. I think I have one of the best staffs in women's college basketball in the country not in the America East, in the country. The three young women I have on my staff are incredible mentors, incredible teachers to our young people in the cohesiveness with which our team sees our, our coaching staff work with can only be a benefit to them. Like they see us work together every day. Um, everybody is not always, I don't have any yes women on my staff. I have people who challenge me every day, but in the correct way. Um, we all are all pulling in the same direction. They bring innovation. They bring new uh, techniques with our, 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 our skill work every day. Uh, they bring stuff to my, my desk daily. Coach, what do you think about this? Tommy, what do you think about this? How can we incorporate this? I know that player A is looking to be a better off the dribble person. So maybe we can incorporate a different player, a different uh, um, practice skill or a different technique that we can incorporate on that day. So my staff and how we work together is the first piece of the puzzle. And then it's consistency. On a daily basis, we talk about what it is to be a river hawk here at UML, how we comport ourselves in the classroom, how we comport ourselves 
in the dining hall, how we dress when we're on the road, how we have to be consistent with our message no matter where we are. And that translates into court activities, how we are in the locker room, how we are in the back of the bus. We talk about all of those things on a weekly basis. Um, we have what we were in, in, uh, calling Riverhawk 101 because we had such a new team, how we had such a big number of freshmen. We had Riverhawk 101. So each week we took part of our practice time and we made it classroom time and we would talk about different, um, different things in, in, in different ways it, it, what it meant to be a Riverhawk basketball player and, and uh, the smallest things. So we take bus rides to some of our games. And at some point in the bus ride, we have to get off the bus and people have bathroom break or we'll go into a, a rest stop. How do we go into a rest stop? Are we going in with hoodies on, with our headphones in, with our sneakers untied? No. So the smallest detail is not insignificant. Um, when you're trying to talk about turning around a culture. People are watching not only how we play, but how we go about our daily lives and how we go about our daily activities. On campus, off campus, people are watching. You're, you're part of something that's bigger than yourself, so you owe it to that bigger entity to take care of how you act and how you um, go about your daily business. So it's an ongoing process, but it's one that we – accept responsibility for, and we're really gung-ho about. You used the phrase there, a Riverhawk basketball player. I wonder, is there a definition, and a quick and easy definition for the purposes here, of how, how you define, maybe in a sentence, what a Riverhawk basketball player is? Uh, we want high-character young people who are accountable to themselves and to the program on a daily basis. That's it. It's pretty simple. Um, uh, my coach in college, Tom Penders, uh, he took over our, the Rhode Island program in my junior year. So I, I worked with Coach Penders for two years. The first day on campus, and this is men's basketball. It's a little different, and it's back. I'm old, so it's back in the 80s, so times were a little different. Culture was a little different. Coach Penders told us uh, there's three things. You have to attend every class. Second thing was be on time when time was involved. And this is where, excuse me, uh, audience, but this is in the 80s. The third thing was don't get arrested for a men's basketball team, right? So it's, my point is it's simple. It's not rocket science. It's easy. Be a good person. Be accountable to yourself and the group that you're a part of, and good things will happen. Now, even though those are only a couple of rules, man, there's so much that's involved in each one of those statements. To be a good person, it's not easy. I mean, it is easy, but it's not. There's, there's different entities that are pulling at these young people every day, social media, people from their home, their AAU coach, their high school coach, their best friend who plays at another college. And, and it's always that whole, my life is better than, I'm going to make my life look better than it actually is potential to all of those things. So we try to get our kids to, to stop listening to all the noise. Look right in front of you on a daily basis and attack your day in the best way possible. Be a good person in everything that you do on a daily basis. And now be accountable to someone else. So it's not just about you. It's about the program. It's about the person who's sitting in the stall next to you. It's about the upperclassman who's put in a lot more work than you time-wise because she's been here longer. It's about the freshman who's coming in and looking for an example on how to be, what it is to be in college. How do I manage my time? How do I get from point A to point B? How do I work hard and practice on a daily basis? So being accountable, there's so many entities and tangents that go with that. So even though it's only two or three rules, it encompasses a whole lifestyle. Coach, we get a question. Uh, from one of our supporters, John Kennedy says, Coach, how is your recruiting going? And how are you able to convince ladies from around the country to come to Lowell and play for you? The recruiting's going really well. I think our first recruiting class was phenomenal. We had four freshmen who were able to contribute um, in a massive way. Anytime you look at our, our any box scores from last season or highlight tapes from last season, 
we were playing up to four freshmen and one sophomore on the court a lot of times. We, we, we had a lot of underclass support um, and, and, and contribution. So going forward, I feel really good about the people that we can attract to UMass Lowell. The, I like to say there's no hidden gems anymore with recruiting. Like there's so many services, so many tournaments, so many AAU teams that everybody gets seen. But there are hidden gems university-wise, and I think UML is one of those. Um, just with our, our, our entrance into Division I basketball not too long ago, uh, in, in the league we play in, it, it was a hidden place up here for a little while a few years back in the America East, but not anymore. Not anymore, and it's, I, I don't think it's a hard sell. Um, here in the Commonwealth, we're 20 minutes outside of Boston, 25 minutes outside of Boston. Lowell is a great city. And our university is burgeoning. Um, I have to give credit to Chancellor Maloney for that. And she, she doesn't take a backseat to anyone as far as putting our university up against other universities in the country in, in comparison. And that trickles down to our athletic department. Peter Casey is the same way. He, he believes that UML is the burgeoning capital of athleticism in, in the country. And that trickles down to the teams uh, under his tutelage. So we have no other reason but to expect big things from our program. And that's how we go out as coaches. We're not trying to shortchange ourselves. Um, we recruit internationally, not just nationally. We're recruiting internationally now. We have a young lady on our team from Australia. We're doing a lot of work over in Europe to try to uh, mine for kids who could help make us a better team and a better program. And we're going all over the country. We're involved with kids in the Midwest, in the West, in the South, and we're getting good interest from those kids um, because we can show what we're doing and we can show the progression of where we're trying to go. And the biggest piece of any recruiting are your current team and the kids you have playing for you now. People look at our team and they see that freshmen were a really important part. So they know that they have the opportunity to come in and contribute right away. But they also look at the interviews after the game. They look at how well-spoken our kids are. They look at the grades and that our kids are, are really attentive to their academics as well. So it's the whole picture. But our kids are the best um, advertisement for our program. So when people come on campus and parents sit and talk with our kids, they want their kids to be a part of what we're doing here. You said there, there's no reason not to expect big things. So I'm curious, what are your expectations down the road? You came in, this is your second year. You came in year one and you probably had a plan in mind of what you wanted to build. What is the, I guess, the ultimate end of that road and how far are we in that process? Well, I think we're on the right track within the process. Uh, I was smiling when you were talking because my expectations are probably unrealistic, but they have been my whole life. Um, my expectations are to win every time I go out on the court. I, it's simple and it's easy. I, I think we're prepared and I think we're talented enough to win every game. Is that realistic? Probably not, but that's what I'm shooting for. And that's what I want our players to shoot for. And that's how I want them to think also. There's a way to lose, right? If you're as prepared as you can be, if you've done everything physically and mentally to get ready and the other team is just better than you, you can rest your head on your pillow and sleep well at night. If you haven't done those things and you lose, then you should be upset or you should be rethinking your strategy. Our kids go into each game as prepared as I can get them. They go in with full hearts and clear minds, right? Friday night lights, and they expect to win each and every game. And that's what you saw when you got to our conference schedule. It didn't, it didn't happen early in the season, but the way that they handled themselves made it attainable late in the season. So it just took us a little time to get there. But when we got there, I think people saw what we were capable of. Um, even my first year, we, we took over, I think we won seven games. Um, and the talk was, wow, your kids are playing so hard. They look like it matters to them. And you guys are overachieving. And I'm thinking, we won seven games. That's not an overachievement to me. But I had to change my paradigm and see it from a different lens. So I was really pleased with our progression from the time we hit the ground in my first year. In this second season, um, people look in, even me, I, 
when I take a step back, I'm really proud of what the young ladies did, but I'm proud for them. I'm proud and happy for them that they were able to attain a level of success that previously hadn't been attained here. But I look at our 0-7 start, and I'm not happy with that. I, I don't think we should have started 0-7. But I had to keep things in perspective and keep moving forward every day. I didn't get overly upset. I didn't get disappointed. I didn't get discouraged because I don't want, I couldn't afford for our kids to, to see that. And I didn't feel that way. It's just, you could possibly feel that way with an 0-7 start, but I knew what we had. And I knew that it was just a matter of time. And I think that going forward, that's always going to be my approach. I don't want to take a back seat to anyone. I don't want to defer my wishes and my hopes for the potential of our team. I don't want to dumb it down for them. This world does not suffer fools lightly, right? So if I dumb it down for them and it slowens or lessens their growth, am I really being a benefit to our student athlete? No, I'm not. I'm going to tell you what the expectation is. I'm going to show you the ring and the light at the end of the tunnel, and you're going to try to go get it, and we're going to help you do that. So going forward, what's my expectation? It's not to go undefeated every year, right? But it's to come pretty darn close. Uh, just in preparation – and believability is, I guess, the best way I could put it. You've got to believe that you're capable. And if you believe that you're capable and you do what's necessary to make that belief a reality, we can all live with the result. So going forward, I think we're right where we're supposed to be. Um, I wish that we were better than 16 and 15, and that's what our goal will be for next year. Uh, and, in, and to also improve on the 11 and 5 conference record and to erase the 0 and 7 starts. A question from the audience. This comes from Steve. He says, Coach, how will this distancing from campus impact the team preparing for the upcoming season? No idea. I, and I say that uh, uh, tongue in cheek a little bit. We're going to make sure our young ladies are healthy and safe and that their families are healthy and safe. Basketball will be there. Basketball and again, understand what I'm trying to say. I love the sport of basketball. It is it has provided me with things and more happiness than I could ever have imagined for my life. But basketball is second right now. It, it, it's about humanity. It's about uh, taking care of each other, taking care of your neighbor, taking care of your family. And if we do that piece right, I feel that when it's time to play basketball again, we will be ready, we will be prepared, and we will put our best foot forward. So uh, right now, our, our kids are doing what they're supposed to do. They're staying safe. They're following the protocols put forth by our government. And we give them body weight workouts. We give them shooting workouts. Some people don't have a basketball hoop to go to. That's why I'm not overly concerned with that aspect of it right now. Everybody is in the same boat. When we're ready to start back to our everyday activities, we're going to go harder than anybody else anyway. We're going to be more consistent with our effort than anyone else anyway. That's my goal, and that's how we'll come out of this okay. No other team in the America East is doing anything more than what we're doing, right? And even if they were, that's really not my concern. My concern is our young ladies, how they're handling this situation, keeping them mentally um, awakened. Um, we get on Zoom chats every week, if not twice a week, to just more than anything say hi see their faces, make sure they're okay, talk about their week, talk about their academics, which finals are over now. And then we talk about social, uh, uh, social things, about the government, about what they feel about what they saw on uh, uh, MSNBC, or we'll talk about uh, current events. And, and that's the best way to keep our kids going forward for when this thing breaks and we're able to get back to our, our old normal. This next question comes from Rich. She says, how do you decide who, and he capitalizes the who, uh, W-H-O, how do you decide who to recruit knowing you are not going to be able to recruit the very top players? Um, I don't know if he's making some assumptions there that shouldn't be made, but uh, how do you know who to recruit? No, I, I get it. I get it. And that's, that's the, um, and nothing against the question, but that's the, type of 
of a uh, thing that we're trying to get by here at UML that we can't recruit the top kids. We can recruit the top kids because at some point our record's going to indicate to those players that this is a place to be reckoned with and you got to shoot your shot, right? Understand that I don't, I'm not going to waste time on a kid who says they have the top five people in women's college basketball as their top five schools. Okay, well, that's fine. Let me go on to someone else. But who we recruit is, is of paramount, paramount of, uh, importance, right? Um, how do we choose that? We obviously look at who they are as basketball players, their skill level, where they are in uh, the year graduation. But more than anything, I like to look at their character. Like I said, I like to look at their integrity and, and how they treat their parents, how they talk to their high school coach in the heat of battle, how they handle their AAU teammates when no one's looking and we're, out, we're able to go out to these tournaments. Uh, typically, on a normal summer, we're able to go out to these tournaments. We get to games early. My staff gets to games early to see people walk into the gym. If they're throwing their water bottle at their mom saying, mom, get me some water, that's not a kid I want to deal with for four years. If you can't respect your parents, then you're not going to respect me. So we do a lot of uh, behind the scenes work. We all know who can shoot a basketball. We all see who can dribble a basketball. We want to see who's going to be coachable, who's going to have the most growth potential. Um, so that's how we choose. And you really never know until someone gets here and they're away from home and they're, they found a, a new level of independence that they've never had before. They're responsible for themselves and what time they go to sleep and what time and what they eat at night um, with our guidance, but mainly on their own. And when they hit a little adversity, then you know who you have. And you have to hope that you guessed right when you sign them. And it's not an exact science. I don't care what anybody tells you. Um, it'd, be, it'd be nice if when we went into schools and talked to these guidance counselors of young ladies, if they were completely 100% unfiltered and honest, but they're not. Nobody wants to hurt a young person's chances of getting a scholarship. So no one's going to tell you that uh, young lady A, from nine in the morning to three at night in the afternoon is someone you don't want to deal with. But from three to five, she's a great kid. No one tells you the behind the scenes thing. So you have to do your homework and, and, and take your best guess. But the stereotype that, um, and the idea that UML can't recruit top players is going to go away here pretty quickly. I know that's uh, what the feeling is outside of our university and our bubble, but inside our university, we know what we have to offer and we're going to get top tier players. We might not get top 10 players. But we'll get top 100 players and we'll turn them into top 10 players. You mentioned they're talking a little bit about family values and, and character. I suppose in some ways that may make this next question appropriate. It was submitted by season ticket holder, Tom via email. He says, you have quite the basketball family at home with your wife being an assistant coach at UConn. Do you ever share tips, thoughts, recruiting events, or do you take a pause from basketball when you're at home? Good question, Tom. We, we do a little bit of both. Um, we're, we're both lifelong basketball um, heads, so it's never really far from the dinner table. Uh, but we do take time out to leave work at work. Uh, we have a 23 month old daughter who uh, requires a lot of our time. So that is the, 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 the genesis and the really the meat and the potatoes of what we do here at home. Uh, but obviously, I, I would be a fool not to, um, to, to mine her experiences at UConn as a, both a player and a coach um, to try to get some insight. Uh, I, I think I know a lot of basketball. I don't think I know all about basketball. So they've done it about as well as anybody could ever do it, men or women. So um, she's willing to share and she's an open book about some of the things that they do with their team and their program. So I definitely um, um, try to get as much information as I can. And she knows my basketball history too. So I've been all over the world playing basketball, coaching basketball, learning about basketball. So she does the same. I think we're a pretty good team in that way. You know, coach, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Uh, you mentioned you're, you're not finished learning. You're still learning this and that about uh, the sport of basketball. I'm curious, as you look at yourself, who are the greatest influences 
uh, on who you've become first as a basketball player, but now as a coach. The greatest influence on who I become as a basketball player and a coach is my mom and dad. First of all, that speaks for itself. The person that they hope that I could become and that they raised me to be has been the biggest benefit to, to what I've done. Um, the work ethic that they instilled in me, the humility that they told me I needed to have, uh, watching them live their lives the way they did and me trying to copy that example. That's the greatest um, benefit to, to, my, to my job now and my time as a basketball player. Outside of my family, um, I've played uh, basketball all over the world for some of the greatest coaches in the world, Larry Brown, Gene Shu, and the pros. And I can tell you, not taking anything away from what I learned from those people, the greatest influences I've had basketball-wise are the people who taught me how to play when I was in seventh grade, um, in junior high, and then in high school. Because they taught me about more than just basketball. They taught me how time, being on time was important, how being respectful of your elders was important, how being accountable to your teammates and respectful of your teammates was important, how being a selfless player, how putting the team ahead of you as an individual was important. Now, the practice drills and the skills that they put me through, I hold to this day. And what's funny is the things that I did, I don't know if my seventh grade coach, um, Mike Kelly was a savant or something, but the things that he had me drill from seventh to ninth grade are the same things I drilled when I got my first camp in the pros with Gene Shue. Fundamentals, triple threat, how to handle the ball, how to shoot the ball. It's the same thing. So I learned just as much as an adolescent about basketball that I learned in the pros. Um, but I've had a lot of great teachers and I pick and steal from all of them. A question submitted, uh, this one uh, from season ticket holder, uh, Mary C. She says, you obviously excelled in the men's game and now coaching in the women's game. Ultimately, basketball is basketball. But what is the biggest difference between the two? Mary, you hit it right on the head. Basketball is basketball. Uh, the biggest thing when I started coaching women, I asked one of my old coaches who had transitioned from the men's game to the women's game, uh, what was the biggest thing? He goes, uh, just watch your language. Your language has to be different. Everything else remains the same. You can talk to guys a little bit differently than you can talk to women. And again, this is an old school coach, so you can imagine what that means. But he said you can talk to men a little differently than you can talk to women. Nothing else changes. Coach them as basketball players, not as women. He goes, that's what I do. I coach them as basketball players. And that's the biggest tip that I've taken. Now, I think the difference, um, and I got to be careful, but I think the difference between coaching men and women is that men compartmentalize a little bit better. So it really doesn't matter what's happening in a young guy's life who's 17 to 21. When he gets to the court that day and he gets to spend three hours practicing, everything else goes away. And that's a good and a bad thing that men compartmentalize, but that's a whole psychological uh, tangent that we don't really have to get into right now, right? But um, everything goes away for that three and a half hours or three hours. For women, if there's an issue, they want to deal with it right now. And I've come to appreciate that. Like, there's no need to let things fester. If they're having an issue on or off the court, they want to handle it before they get to the next thing that they're going to that day. And I appreciate that. And I've come to, to, to really um, um, believe in that mindset also. But that's the biggest difference for me. Now, obviously, physically, there are some men who jump way higher. There are some men who can be a little stronger. But the game, fundamentally, I think is a better game on the women's side. It's played below the rim for the most part. And it's attainable visually for everybody. So the layman who is a basketball fan can get more out of the women's game than they can out of the men's game because it's more realistic to them. Uh, you can devise any kind of defense you want, but if whoever LeBron's playing with throws the ball up to this corner of the backboard, that guy can jump up and go get it. There's no defense for that. You can control and manipulate a lot more of the women's game because um, it's more realistic to everybody. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. 
<clears throat> but also you, you talked a little bit there about no defense for someone getting up above the rim, so on and so forth. But it, it makes me wonder, for a USA coach, is it a – does – is it, you know, basketball, we think of it, offensive games, those that score points make headlines. But is, it, but is basketball, because I thought this team was terrific defensively this year, is it more about defense than offense? It depends on your personnel. Yeah, for us it was more about defense because we didn't have that consistent 20-point-a-night score. We had contributors all throughout our roster, but – there were nights where we didn't know who was going to get us 15, who was going to get us 10, how we were going to piecemeal, you know, 15 points from our low block players, how we were going to get four threes from our perimeters. We didn't know on a, con on a consistent basis who was going to give us what, but we knew what we could do defensively. And our philosophy defensively was to make the other team find their third and fourth options and not get beat by their first and second. Nobody wants to be made uncomfortable on a basketball court. So when you make people uncomfortable and make them have to play basketball and not just play a system, that's where we found our most success this year. You say we don't have a 20 point a night score. I'm kind of curious. Can we get a 20 point a night score or is the game such that those are few and far between and I don't care which school you are, you're still struggling to try to find somebody such as that. They're definitely rare, but they're out there and we're searching for one but they're definitely rare. But if in lieu of finding one, getting uh, three 15 point a night scores is a great thing too. So being diverse on offense isn't a bad thing. So what I mean by a 20 point a night score is when things get bogged down, you have a young lady who can go get a basket no matter what, or who can figure out how to get to the free throw line no matter what. Meaning she has to have a really great handle, a really great basketball IQ and a really great shot. So the defense can't take one thing away and she can manipulate a situation to get a scoring opportunity. And those are very rare on any side, men and women. So um, we're out there looking and they're out there. There's a couple and, and we're trying to attain them to bring their talents here. When you played in the NBA, you faced one of those people that could go out and get a basket when his team absolutely needed a basket. That was Michael Jordan. And one of our out in the audience just right simply, what was it like to play against MJ? Oh, what was it like to play against MJ? It was like playing against a loaded deck, right? It was, it, it was like, you know, going into the game, no matter what you did, no matter how hard you worked, no matter how good your preparation was, the person you were playing with was going to be able to counter anything you did. So it's, I, I don't want to say helpless. I don't want to say it's a helpless feeling. It's a challenge. It was a challenging endeavor, but it was one where, He's the only person I've ever played against where when things didn't go well, I didn't feel bad about the outcome. I would just go, oh, well, what can you expect? It was one of those things where everybody, everybody shoots for what Michael Jordan was able to do, right? And, and I, this is what I mean by that. There was never a time when if we're watching The Last Dance, if anybody's out there watching The Last Dance, these last episodes where Gary Payton was on, and he talked about how he made Mike uncomfortable and he was just going to tire Mike out. It wasn't cocky when you saw Michael Jordan reading the iPad and start laughing. It was reality because that's, this is my point. This is what everybody wants as a basketball player. That at the end of the day, when I look at the box score and I see what my shooting percentages were, I don't even think about the defense. If I shot four for 15, I go, I was just off that day. And I know how to make that adjustment. The defense had nothing to do with it. Or if I shot 14 for 16, that's what I expect. That's how Michael Jordan was. There was nothing you could do to stop him. It was just a matter of, is he on from 23 feet today? And is he going to adjust to take me down 10 feet from the basket and jump over me? Or what can I try to take away to make him uncomfortable? But that guy's approach was at the end of each quarter, he was, he, like I said, he was like a, a, a human calculator. He was going to decide and decipher what was working, what wasn't. And at the second quarter, he was going to change and adapt. And in the second quarter, he'd do the same thing at halftime. And at the end of the third quarter, he'd do the same thing. So throughout the whole game, he was making adjustments to what he was seeing defensively. And his adjustments were better than your adjustments. So you couldn't ever stop him. 
So you, you see people say, I stopped my, no, you didn't. No one did. He might've had an off night. And what did he do to you the next night? That's the key. Cause he came back and he destroyed you the next night. So everybody att- is, is looking to attain that, but only Michael Jordan ever achieved it. Um, Michael Jordan and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, I guess. Right. <laughs> You got you to gotta include the guy who has a shot named after him, the Skyhook, who has a shot specifically that no one else has ever been able to duplicate in the history of basketball since him. That's amazing to me that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar isn't in those arguments as uh, best ever player. How can he be the leading scorer in the league and have a shot that no one else has been able to duplicate? There's been seven footers in our, in our league since Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. None of them have been able to shoot a Skyhook. That guy is the leading scorer in the NBA with one shot and a lot of a great work ethic and a great motor. How is he not in the conversation? Because he wasn't able to handle the ball like Kobe and LeBron and, and all these, like guards aren't the only people who should be in that conversation. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar doesn't get justice. I know he's in the top five. He should be in the top two. It should be Michael Jordan, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and then put people on that list after that. Fair enough. Um, I want to get back to this women's basketball team. One of the things that jumped out at me during this season, uh, Lencia Rowling, who I thought was absolutely terrific, gets injured. And I wondered how this team would respond. And they responded terrifically while we saw Jelena Sanchez really step up and begin to control games. For you as a coach, was there a moment of apprehension when, when Lencia Rowling went down, kind of wondering what the future held? Or did you know what the future held? I'm not a fortune teller, but I'd like to say I had a pretty decent idea of what our, for, our future was going to look like. I was so disappointed and so hurt for Rencia. First of all, she was having a phenomenal year. Um, and with her on the court, with Jelena, it gave us a, two point, a two-headed point guard type of feel. So I was able to interchange and run certain sets with Jelena at the point and with Rencia at the point, and it kept defenses off balance. Um, after she got hurt, I was just disappointed for her because she was doing everything that was required of her. Uh, coming in as a JUCO transfer is never easy. Her first year was a little bit of ups and downs, peaks and valleys. But her second year, her final year, was shaping up to be one of the best years in the history of our of, of our program. Um, so I was really upset and disappointed for her. But secondly, the second part of the question is, uh, I knew that we had people on the bench who were capable of stepping up. And that they were going to have to rise to the occasion. So I knew we had the ability to supplement what we were going to miss by having Rencia be hurt. Um, Did I know it was going to turn out the way it did? I hoped it would. Uh, We lost a couple of games right after Rencia got hurt that I was, you know, disappointed that we lost because people weren't ready to step into those roles right away. It was kind of a shock and it was kind of an emotional roller coaster for our kids to see one of their teammates have a season, season ending injury. And you can never be uh, too aware of how that's going to affect a team. And it affected us in our first couple of games after she got hurt. But we were able to right that ship. We were able to get everybody pointed in the same direction. And a couple of people stepped up, uh, mainly Kaylin Van Swearing and um, Tiana Sears. And then the people who were in our starting lineup took a step forward too. Karis Item, uh, Jelena Sanchez, uh, Shamija Price came up. Like All of our kids contributed and did some really great things. I would remind people that if you have a question, um, use the chat box. You can find it at the bottom of the screen. And um, I would also just uh, throw in for myself, I was curious when we were talking earlier about recruiting. When you go into a recruiting season, so to speak, do you go in with specific goals in mind? we got to find somebody bigger. We have to find a, uh, a lights-out shooter. Are the particular individual types of players or contributors that you're looking for, or is it a different approach? You know, let's find uh, the best player out there. No, we're definitely looking um, for pieces to add to our puzzle, right? So on different years, different needs arise. So with graduation uh, and people transitioning out of your program, you do have to fill specific needs most of the time. What we're trying to attain in our program is almost positionless basketball. Um, We don't want one dimensional players. So we don't want just a point guard. We want a point guard who can handle the ball, get us into our sets, but also like I was talking about with Rencia and Jelena, who can be diverse and play off the ball now also to give the defense a different look. 
it's easy to defend when you know exactly what the offense is, where they're coming from. So if you're coming from point A 95% of the time, I know, where to get, I know where to meet you and I know how to meet you. But if you're coming from off the ball, off pick and rolls, now you're coming from off ball screens, you're coming off fade screens, you're coming off down screens. Well, I'm not really adept at defending all of those screens all the time in a 40 minute game. So diversity is the biggest thing, but recruiting wise, you have to fill some gaps depending on what you lose um, through attrition and through graduation. But overall, that's where you want to recruit kids who are multidimensional so that when you do lose a piece through injury or through graduation, someone else on your team can step in and supplement that and take over. And the more you have that, the better off you'll be and the more depth you have. So each year our recruiting needs change. So Sometimes we're looking for a person who can be a point guard, but we want that point guard to be able to contribute from the off guard position too. Sometimes we're looking for a back to the basket bruising post, but we also need that bruising back to the basket post to be able to stretch the offense for the benefit of the rest of the players on the team and be able to hit a face up 15 foot or two. So the needs vary every year, but we don't want to get pigeonholed into taking one dimensional players if we can help it. All right. I guess we're going to kind of close this out. So in, in closing, someone writes in and says, uh, what are you most excited about as you move toward the future? I'm just excited about the prospect of uh, UMass Lowell being a powerhouse in the Northeast corridor. First of all, um, I think we can do that. Uh, I think we're on our way to that. And I'm excited about pulling young people in who deserve to experience what we have here. That's the biggest thing in recruiting. A lot of people don't even understand what we're about and what we have to offer. And I'm excited to give some young people um, who deserve this opportunity. And what I, what I mean by that, who deserve to be coached well, who deserve to strive for championships, who deserve to have mentors like my three assistant coaches are and myself, how we are to our kids. They deserve that opportunity. So I'm excited to share our level of um, consistency, passion with the young people coming up. Uh, Coach Tom Garrick, uh, delight talking uh, with you for this period of time. I think it's the longest that you and I have ever talked because usually I'm running up and down the sidelines or exhausted at the baseline trying to take pictures and so no, on. So been great. I definitely appreciate you taking the time. So it's been an education for me and I always like to learn and you uh, are proving to be a terrific teacher. Anyway, I thank you very much for, for this. I thank those in the audience. Uh, that submitted questions to uh, keep this thing going. Uh, we thank everybody for being involved. I will turn it back over to John Boswell if he wants to tell us about such things that may be coming up. But I do like Coach Garrick's idea of seeing if we can do more things like this, uh, whether we are in a uh, health crisis or whether it's just a normal day in the city of Lowell. Thank you, Bob, and thank you to Coach for taking the time today. And most of all, thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, if these Chats have been great and a great way to show our UMass Lowell pride. Uh, thank you to Rich. Rich will be following up with you about uh, coming over to the women's basketball season ticket side as well. And uh, thank you to Drake at House of Pizza for once again sponsoring this great event uh, and using code UML to get your 15% off your online order with d uh, Again, thank you all. I hope you're uh, staying safe, staying healthy. Enjoy the sunshine outside. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, at a Riverhawks basketball game in the fall soon. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe.